second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, so I think that's done. Yeah. <laughs> Chair, is, we are now open. Let's do this. Let's um, convene the meeting. Public comments. At this time, the public can um, chat with us should they so desire. We move on to approval of minutes. Uh, so moved. First, second, call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Consent calendar. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd just like to uh, remove item number six for just a brief uh, introduction um, from our, uh, Tim Hill. Okay, we'll remove from consent item six. And I would move items, um, the remaining items. Second. I have a first and a second. You got it, Christian. There's only three of us, so <laughs> we can do it. Uh, so I'll call for the vote for the other items. All in favor say aye. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. We go to item six. So I'll let uh, Susan Miller, our project manager, to, to okay. introduce oh, this item. excuse me. All right. Um, I'd like to go through a little background on this project and present this item. Um, good morning, commissioners. I'm Susan Miller, director of projects. Um, the I-680 Northbound Express Lane project is part of the suite of projects for Innovate 680. It's the largest civil component. The project will reduce or eliminate the gap in the carpool lane on Northbound 680 with the goal of completing a carpool express lane system from the county line to the Benicia Martinez Bridge. The project limits are from Lavorna Road to just south of the bridge and is very complicated by the lack of available right-of-way for expansion and the many structures in the vicinity of State Route 24. A Caltrans Project Initiation Document, or PID, was completed in November 2018. Uh, 2018. That's the first step in the um, official step in the Caltrans process um, for project approval. In this case, MTC is our partner on the project and has provided Federal Surface Transportation Program funds under a funding agreement for the next phase of work, which is environmental cl clearance and project approval. So we issued a request for proposal for this next phase of work on January 7th of this year. And in response, the authority received four proposals. The evaluation criteria included qualifications and related experience and references proposed staffing and project organization, and also a specific work plan for this particular project. Additionally, due to the federal funding, a disadvantaged business enterprise or DBE goal was established for 19%, and it's 19% for this particular project. Interviews were held by a panel consisting of authority staff, MTC staff, TransPAC and SWAT representatives, and Caltrans staff. Upon completion of the process, combining proposal and interview scores, HDR was ranked first. Staff has completed the negotiations with HDR on the scope, fee, and schedule, and is currently working on federal pre-award audit process with Caltrans. So today, um, staff is seeking authorization for the chair to execute agreement number 520 with HDR upon completion of the pre-award audit in the amount not to exceed $7,936,635 and also approve a contingency in the amount of $1,063,365 for a total budget of $9 million. And also delegate authority to negotiate and execute amendments within the contingency to the executive director or designee. Um, today we have Sheena Patel, who's the project manager with HDR in the audience, and she's here and available to um, answer any questions and assist me in answering any questions that you may have. Obviously. We <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no. Thanks for that presentation. Um, just to be clear, because um, this isn't a capital project, this is about engineering services. So the only fee proposal we got is from the selected firm? Um, correct. Right, because we don't... We don't we're not bidding services. No, we it's not. It's based on quality. Qualifications and we negotiate. Okay. Yeah. Well, great. Well, I appreciate the explanation, just given the size of the contract, just to have a little clarity of what it is. Um, um, and obviously, all all the folks that propose on this are great firms. Um, so I, with that, I would move the item. I have a first. 
Second. Second. Any more discussion? Call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. We have been to regular uh, legislative updates. Good morning, item, item seven. Good morning, commissioners. I just want to touch briefly on a few items that were in your packet related to um, the federal side of the house, and then I'll have Mr. Watts give an update on the what's happening at the state level. Um, for those of you on transit boards, you may want to pay attention to the notice of funding opportunities that are in your packet and share those with those agencies. CCTA has also shared them with our transit operators, but there are some good opportunities for, for funding some transit initiatives coming out of the Federal Transit Administration right now. Um, there's also a link to APTA, the American Public Transportation Association's report on transit ridership that might be of interest given some of the discussion we've been having about the development of a transportation expenditure plan. Um, and also, um, our one of our delegates, Mr. Desaunier, is sponsoring a bill to establish a grant program for the installation of electrical vehicle charging infrastructure and hydrogen fueling infrastructure along the national highway system. So I know that um, our team is traveling to Washington, D.C. next week, so we'll be speaking with him about that and perhaps bringing that back before this body uh, to take a position on once we learn some more details about that as well. Um, and since we're traveling to D.C. next week, I think we'll have probably a more robust federal update the following month to give you on activities. Those, these trips have been um, very successful for CCTA in terms of building relationships um, and finding out about upcoming funding opportunities. Um, and we've also been successful in advocating for streamlining some regulations for the types of work that we do. So it's a really great exercise that we do every year to continue to keep in touch with that uh, potential source of funding and, and also keep track of what regulations are coming down the pipeline. So I'm happy to answer any questions about the federal report or just let Mr. Watts jump into the state side of the house. Good morning, Mr. Chair and uh, commissioners. Um, this is the point in time where two major uh, legislative calendar issues come to the fore. Last Friday was the deadline to move bills out of the House of Origin. So it was very, uh, very hectic week. At the same time, um, subcommittees of the, bud of the uh, budget committee were winding up their work and the uh, the, the uh, conference committee on the budget has commenced uh, late last week and is in uh, mid-stride right now. Uh, interestingly enough, in the area of transportation, almost everything that was proposed by the governor was either accepted or slightly modified, and there's only a couple, a handful of small items that were in conference, and they, those were member requests, um, and those are being dealt with right now behind the scenes, uh, member, member requests, Harken back to the old days when you used to have a long line of legislators asking for project money. This time there was probably a half a dozen of those, and those are uh, the things that the conference committee is paying attention to now. Uh, in the area of legislation, there are two key bills that have been important for the county that are moving through. Uh, one is Mr. Grayson's uh, AB 1025 that deals with the um, uh, Iron Horse Trail. And it got out of the assembly. It's moving forward. It was amended to uh, have the county grant a spot on the oversight board for the Iron Horse Trail to the authority so that you can integrate better the um, uh, policy actions of the two bodies. Um, so that would dispense with the repay potential repayment of 35-year-old grants, uh, which is the looming issue that's being addressed in the bill. The other measure is by uh, uh, Assemblymember Bauer Kayan, and that bill was introduced at our request. Um, it's been a little bit modified, and we're even happier with the modified version. The original version would have just simply authorized the authority to undertake CMGC procurement for the San Ramon, um, for, for a bridge in San Ramon related to the Iron Horse Trail. Now the bill was uh, amended to be broader application so that any um, any public RTPA, any transportation planning agency in the state would be able to undertake um, pro, uh, CMGC um, contracting authority on behalf of a city or county. 
if they requested it. So it's a it's a a bill that's, that's uh, moving through the process, and we think it'll pass easily. Uh, two other, two other bills I want to draw your attention to, and then I'll talk about one other item. Uh, there's a bill by Assemblymember Gloria that has moved out of the Assembly into the Senate, and it deals with the sub-county tax jurisdiction. It authorizes a county sales tax authority if they're going to do another tax or they're formed to do a tax for the first time to be able to design a tax authority based on a couple of cities and um, any any affiliated in unincorporated areas. Um, it's being pushed by the author um, strongly. He introduced the same bill last year but got into a um, an issue down in San Diego and laid the bill over. So this year he's come back and moving forward with it. I just noted it's an interesting new approach for sales uh, sales tax counties. Additionally, uh, the other measure that's important for sales tax counties would be ACA1 by Aguirre Curry. That measure is, <laughs> is on the assembly floor still, but because it's a constitutional amendment, did not need to meet last week's deadline. So I think they're just waiting for an appropriate point in time to move the bill so they can get into the Senate and keep it moving for um, approval this year to go on next year's ballot. The idea is to put on the ballot at the same time or in November at the same time some other uh, entities may be choosing to pursue local sales taxes and have an, an operative section in the bill that would uh, allow those to go into effect under the, the lower reduction, the lower vote threshold. Pardon me. Uh, lastly, uh, we'd been tr uh, we had developed legislation to uh, to deal with the extension of the sales tax uh, uh, sunset for the authority that sunsets in 2020, um, and none of the delegation members uh, had elected to introduce it by bill introduction time. So I'm keeping an eye out for potential legislation that might accommodate this as an amendment, and uh, I'll keep. Keep staff uh, aware of that. Uh, finally, I just want to point out a couple of uh, appointments that have been made by the Newsom administration. I think um, last time I reported that David Kim, uh, Washington expert, uh, California, California's representative for governors, several governors in Washington, and most recently uh, working for one of the major automobile companies, I believe Hyundai, has been uh, appointed to be the secretary of the Transportation Agency, Brian Annis, who had been secretary, has accepted a position as the CFO for the High Speed Rail Authority, where he brings his Department of Finance expertise into the foreground. In addition, the governor also appointed uh, a transportation undersecretary by the name of Alyssa Canove, and she has been an executive with Metrolink the last couple of years, but she had formerly come from FTA and FHWA, so now you've got between Kim and Canove, you have two transportation experts running the transportation agency, uh, which I, with federal experience, which I think with look at what's going on in the, in the foreground with uh, with Washington and infrastructure and all that is going to um, bear good news for California. Uh, last week, Director Caltrans Director Lori Berman announced she's going to retire. Uh, there has been no announced replacement, and finally, there's still two vacant. CTC commissioner positions, um, and I've been in touch with a couple of the candidates, and they haven't been talked to in a couple of weeks, so we're not sure what's going on there. And with that, that brings my presentation to a close, and I'll ha happily answer any questions. Questions? <laughs> Anything? Yeah, Mark, thanks again. Uh, I know things are moving at rapid speed up in Sacramento these days, and it's hard to keep up. Um, with those two CC. CTC. Transport, yeah, CTC. Too many C's. Yeah. Uh, uh, who are those two candidates and where are they from? Well, I know of one of okay. the candidates. And there are a multiplicity of candidates I don't know about. Oh, okay. So, but the one, I, I think I said two, but one dropped out. But the one I do know about is Will Kempton. Oh. Who would be a very good CTC commissioner with all of his experience. But unfortunately, he's not being, I don't think he's being um, talked to. And all that tells me is that they're not ready to make the appointment. Yeah. Not that they have anything against him. Okay. Hasn't he retired about Thanks. three times? Yes. Maybe more. Yes, he's like. Or, or maybe more? Four. Oh, okay. Just thought I'd ask. Yeah, he'd make a good quarterback for. Uh, uh, yes. 
replacing some folks. I, I have a question. Yeah. No. Yes, sir. Randy. Uh, Mark, this, a couple things. One, uh, Chairman Fraser made a uh, request of the Budget Committee for $5 million for the McCallamy Bridge. And the uh, ask was in lieu of the $5 million of state of good repair dollars that were identified for the relinquishment of State Route 4, the bypass. Oh, okay. And the board made a decision to move forward with the relinquishment before we could finalize the agreement on state of good repair. Okay. So maybe we can get $5 million. So keep an eye on that $5 million for the bridge. The bridge is designed, it's mitigation for severing, severing a trail when the bypass is built and the bike bus community really wants that bridge and so stephanie who has done a good job of overseeing the design so it's at 100 percent and then we've had a conversation with uh, chairman bell on the senate transportation side about switching from a 50 50 local partnership program to 95 percent uh, formulaic five percent right now the only amount of money that ct ccta gets is two point Three or 2.4 million a year out of SB1. So there's a lot of money being generated, but that's, we get 2.4. So if it's population based, we go pretty close to 4.9. And then we asked for a multi year allocation because every year we've got to make a, and you'll, you, I know you're going to pull the item, but our project management consultants have to fill out all that paperwork to get the, those dollars every single year. And to us, it just it seems like it's a repetitive process. If we're going to get it, it's in legislation. Let's go multi-year and let's really make a, a good effort to program those dollars for the right projects to help jumpstart the, the project. So that's two things that maybe you could watch for us is that 95.5 uh, LPP and SB1 and then um, Chairman Fraser's request of $5 million for the McCollumy Bridge. Absolutely. I'll, I'll, in fact, I'll touch base with Mr. Fraser's office, and I'll just make one last comment on Mr. Bell. He's been the one who's looked for multi-year applications in other programs, so hopefully he'll be able to make it happen this time. All right. Anything else? Thank you. You're heading back to Sacramento. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for the report. Uh, moving to 80. This is the year 2019-20, proposed budget, cost of transportation authority, and congestion management agency. Good morning, Chair Taylor and Commissioners. Um, today is a highlight of the Finance Department's uh, annual process of putting the full operating budget together for fiscal year 1920. Um, first of all, I want to thank CCTA staff for all of their participation and the extensive work um, that goes behind the scenes in putting together all of the individual projects and programs that we have involved. And they also manage a, a number of consultants who play a major role in getting all this information together for the capital project program. Um, with that said, I'm going to jump into the proposed summary of changes. Um, this is just a general overview, 30,000 foot level look at the individual projects and programs and just a summary of everything that we do. Um, you can see that we have about a $240.6 million budget. Um, our number one item that we always look at every year is sales tax revenue. Um, we've been talking about this for quite, quite a while. Um, as you can see, we've been working with HDL to try and figure out what's going to happen on sales tax revenue basis in the county. Um, there's a lot of different things going on politically, globally that are affecting this. Um, there's a lot of local things that are going on. Um, and I'll get into some of the sales tax stuff as we go through the slide. Um, you can see that the federal, state, and local revenues combined is about $47, $48 million which is an increase. It also is an increase and it always decreases based on where we are in the phases in the capital project programs. We have three large projects um, starting this year and I'll go through those as we follow through um, the presentation as well. 
Um, and as we come down to the local revenues, the local revenues is about $17 million, and that's made up of RM2 money. There's a little chunk in there for RM3 money for the McCollumy Bridge that Randy was just talking about. Should we move forward in the availability on those funds as well? We have BATA funds, um, and we also have some ECRFA and the closing out of the Balfour project. And we look down at the investment and other income. Um, if you go back several years, we were looking at $750,000. Um, the amount of money we have invested that is being controlled by um, CCTA, but we use um, a consultant to help us on our investment choices. The interest, um, just from a number of years ago, was less than about 1%. Right now, we're looking closer to 2.5% on some of our investments. And when I looked up our investments this morning in preparation for this, um, a big thing is market value. Um, so on the finance side, we have the GASB rules, and we always have to report things at the end of the year for our CAFR based on a market value. Um, right now, since the interest rates and, and, and everybody's moving into buying interest, the value, you know, the interest rates available now have come down, but the purchases that we have that are in about a one to two year window, those values are up. So on our $133 million that we have in investments, that's earmarked for our projects and programs here, we're up about $1.3 million, $1.4 million in market value, which is, which is good, but we, we hold it till full maturity. We get all of our interest, so it, it kind of comes down a little bit as well. Um, so our projections is about three three million dollars. Um, a lot of the interest income in there as well comes from our bond proceeds, which is right below that. Um, in June of 2017, we issued bonds for the capital project program of about 100 million dollars. You can see we used about 46 and a half million dollars in the first year. You can see that we've used about 32 million dollars this year, and we're going to use the remaining funds um, next fiscal year. Um, usually, when we go out and bond for capital projects, they try and make sure that you stay within like a three-year window. Otherwise, you've overfunded, you've, you've gone out, and you're spending more on interest income. So we're fitting just about perfect in that window. Um, with the number of projects that we have going on, you can see that the other sources of revenue is about $70 million. Um, a lot of this is due to the three major capital project programs that we got going on. Um, of that $70 million, $55 million is going to be used for the capital projects, the, the ones that we call CIP projects one through nine. Um, and I'll go over that piece as well. Um, and then we also have the PED bike and the TLC programs that are starting to ramp up with the Kirker Pass, which is about four and a half million dollars. And then we also have the BART, the, the Del Norte, which is I think about five, five million dollars as well. So with that, I'll move on to the second slide and talk about sales tax revenue. So I've modified this slide for this year because I want to continue to look just past this year. Um, when we put a budget together in the capital program, it's never about the year that you're in. It's about looking into the future and additional funding that you have. And this is this last year, we hire, hired HDL to help us with our forecasting. We've been using that for the TEP. Um, and it's really, it's really helped us in putting together the strategic plan and trying to guide the next five years of where we are. Um, again, we still don't know what's going to happen this year. We don't know what's going to happen next year. But we're taking a conservative approach. So our budget for this year was about $91.1 .1 million. You can see right there I've added a column in the middle, which is our estimate. My estimate for this year is going to come in at about $95 million, which is 5% higher than our budget. Um, the number one question is why. Um, in May of 2018, the Board of Equalization transferred into the California Department of Tax and Finance, um, and they implemented a new reporting system for people to, like corporations and every individual as well, for filing their sales tax. The program was very difficult. Um, and it was overwhelming for the state to, to manage the program. So a lot of payments from the prior fiscal year are still starting to trickle into this fiscal year. Um, so that's without the extensive knowledge and the, and the, and the adjustments and going back and looking at what quarter this information is with HDL. Um, we, 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 could be, we could have been making some bad decisions thinking the economy is still really robust in Contra Costa County and not having an eye on it, the exact, exact issues that are going on. So it's going to be probably close to about $4 million. Um, next week, I will be getting from HDL an updated report that will be able to show us 
how much extra money we've collected in the first three months or the first nine months of uh, this fiscal year, which is three quarters of information. And I'll be able to report to the full authority board how much additional funds, where we are um, looking to be at the end of the year and kind of have a, a better picture on this 95 million. Um, and through working with HDL and looking at the slowing down of some of the automobiles is one of the bigger areas and retail has slowed down just a little bit. We're going with a very modest increase from the budget of 2019 to 2020 of about 0.7%, but you can see that's a 4% reduction from the 95. And then not part of this budget, but the 2021 is going to be about 1.5%. We think it's going to be flat, but we still don't know, but I just want to put that out there. We're, we're trying to look into the future. We're not trying to just focus on one year at a time. We're always trying to stay ahead of the curve and make sure that we don't over over promised individual cities additional funding for the programs. Um, as I just discussed, this is kind of where we are with the 2018 over 2017. You can see we had a 5% increase and that's adjusted um, based off of the timing of these things, not when we received the cash. So you can see in the prior fiscal year where we had a very slight cash increase, we didn't report a full 5.4% because we didn't receive the money and that money is going to be coming in this fiscal year. You can see in the first half of this fiscal year through December of 2018 versus the prior year, we're still up about 3.4%. Um, but the word from HDL and all the analysis that I've been seeing is it's starting to slow down just a little bit. But when we come back to the authority board, I will have nine months of information and I'll be able to give a much better you know, picture of where we are today and where we think we're going to be in three months. Um, again, on the capital projects, you can see we, we have an increase from 35 million to 47, almost $48 million. Um, as we go through, um, again, I always want to highlight, it's not a loss or a gain of funding when we have a change. It's all based off the timing of our projects and when we think we're going to be reimbursed. As we get to one of the other slides, you'll see one of the other programs we had. I think it was the the SR4 bypass, we're going to have a net revenue this year because by the time we get the billing, by the time we get the reimbursements, it's going to far exceed what our expenses are because we're starting to close out that project. Um, so you can see the RM2 funds have decreased a little bit, but our BATA funds have increased $9 million. Um, we've additionally received some shop funds. Um, we have some other state funds, local funds as well. Um, and I'll go through those on the next slide as well. So our, our planning, planning department, congestion management authority, and we also have a, a priority development area through, that's all gone, done through Martin's division and the planning division. We get about 1.2, $1.3 million on an annual basis to help fund the congest, uh, congestion management authority. We also have a small contribution this year, which I think is, you know, was worthy of highlighting $150,000. CCTA is taking over for Transpac to do uh, a study on Monument Boulevard, how to improve some traffic flow, how to improve, improve some bike and pedestrian movement there. So it's us working again like we are down in uh, San Ramon helping put in a bridge. This isn't as big as that, but it's us trying to work with our local agencies to help improve it. Um, based on our budget for the CMA, um, there's going to be an in-kind contribution from all of the, the agencies. To, should we build out all of these projects and programs, which is about $409,000, typically it runs around $200,000. We don't finish all these projects and studies, but we do put it in there. Um, it is adopted by the PMA in April, um, so they know it's coming down the pipeline should all of these projects and programs be uh, finished. The TFSA pr program is about $1.7 million. Again, we're looking into the future. If there's less car sales, the registration numbers come down. Maybe next year the revenue numbers might be down just a little bit as well. The new fund that we had a lot of activity in this year of about $1.2 million um, is going to continue into next year at about $1.2 million. We have about $945,000 coming from the state to help fund the program. We also have an in-kind contribution from Gomenum that we received uh, last year. We hold it as a deposit, and that $280,000 is to be used for CCTA staff, CT CCTA staff on their timesheets allocates their time that they spend on Gomenum, and we draw down on those additional funds to help pay for that portion. 
our capital projects. Um, our capital projects is $101.4 million, and that's just Measure J funded. Um, we have, again, the allocations of about $47.5 million of federal, state, and local revenues. And the chart below is going to kind of walk you through this process and walk you through how it's done. Um, and we have program bond funds, and we also have some program Measure J funds. So again, on the far left-hand side, you have your large capital project programs, which falls just right out of the strategic plan. We're expected to spend about $101 million this year. You can see that we have on the I-680 corridor, um, we have the HOV express lanes. We also have the SR4 interchange 160, which is about $37 million. So within those two project areas, you're looking at spending close to $80, $85 million in there. Um, and then the $47.5 million, you can see where that is on those individual charts and columns in the middle. You can see RM2 funding is $3 million. You can see it's going, the majority is to the 680 corridor. Um, we have nine million Nevada funding for the I-680 corridor. We have about we have state funding for the SR4 I-680 interchange um, is about twenty three and a half million dollars for this particular year. Um, when you get to the far right hand column, you go down to the bottom, you see that there's still a balance of about fifty four million dollars. And what that's going to be funded with is twenty one and a half million dollars of the remaining bond proceeds. And then from there, you take out there's project money that we have received from sales tax revenues in years before has accumulated. Um, that's estimated to be about 55 or 60, 60 million dollars that's set aside that we have invested. Um, should all of these budgets come to fruition and we use 100% of it, we're going to have to come up with 32 and a half million dollars. And I've been working with our investment team to make sure that we have a draw schedule so that we don't have any losses by having to draw funds early. Um, and I don't want to be able to pull, pull things out now that are at higher investment value than what they might be today if we needed to pull them out. So we're always looking into the future and working on that. I think we have a question. Um, call the cut tunnel. Six million dollars. What, what, how are we, what's going on here? Um, we were supposed to be wrapped up, we thought, in March of this year. And we'd shown the money. I didn't see the six million being listed. Uh, let, let me try to answer the question. The, uh, the Caldecott Tunnel, there are three main projects. The, white, the fourth bore, which is done on that, pro and then the landscaping, which concluded in February or March of this year. And then there are settlement projects in Oakland and Berkeley, which will be done this year. Uh, on the Caldecott Tunnel main bore, there is a request by Caltrans to pay for cost overrun on the oversight. We have told them at, at, at this point, we're telling them we're not reimbursing them for it unless something changes. And so there is some discussion about it. This budget just accounts in case the board decides to pay for it. We have it in the budget. So what's the $6 million for? It's not $6 million for Caltrans. You're saying it's, it's for the it's mitigation. Five. It's $5 million. Most of it is for that. For Caltrans. For where we were talked in and strong-armed into actually paying them for something that we as taxpayers pay for them to do, pay the capital project, the first contract, we agreed to give them some reimbursement, play nice at the table, and because of their absolute inefficiencies and their they're, they just can't stop. I mean, you know this on every project, even in our projects and auxiliary lanes. If we didn't cut them off, they'd still be working on those projects. So another $5 million. Tell me what your friends are up to, Randy. I can see you want to explain this. This is $5 million? So this is one of the reasons why early on in my tenure here, we made the decision, you made the decision, when we requested to take a look at creating a position to do construction for us on the state highway system, interstate system in our county, because you get these late bills. So this is, uh, uh, the five million is late CM construction costs that when the state tabulates all their building, they came in late, uh, was it two, two and a half years later? Yeah, about two, two and a half years later and said, and by the way, and we have no co-op, the co-op is expired, and the co-op very specifically says that 
we, you have to bill us within 90 days? Yep. Nine, 90 days. And so two and a half years later, we get a bill that comes over their desk saying, you owe us an additional $5 million for CM services for the state because the state provided the resident engineer. Subsequently, we, except for the landscaping project, we supply all the CM, and so we don't have this problem anymore. So we're in the, in the situation arguing with the state saying, you can't bill us this late because one of the things we always hear is, Oh, uh, you got to put this sign structure in over here, and it's not. I know it's not on the plans, but you sign the co-op, and the co-op says that you know, this is a requirement for safety or whatever. And we're complaining like crazy. So we, the reason why this is still on the budget is because the, at, the, at the end of the day, the state's going to could zero out our stip. They could they could do other things to pay to pay for this five million because they've got to close the project out. They got to report to the California Transportation Commission. That the project's closed out right now. There's a five million dollar. What do you call it? Is it a debit or a bill? Or it's a bill. So somebody has to pay for this, and so we're arguing the point. So there may be some negotiations. Fund a auxiliary lane on Interstate 680 at a different location for 40, 50, 60 million dollars, and then we'll give you the we'll pay the five million dollars out of the measure money. So we're negotiating. We want to come to you with a good solid counter proposal because we know <laughs> we're going to get that response and, and I'm so mild <laughs> we're, yeah we're prepared for that we're trying to prepare for that response in the greater board meeting but so so far we haven't paid because we say we don't have to pay because it's, it's expired and and we share your frustrations that's why we take the risk yeah. and yeah. so that, that's well, really the issue that. so um who's auditing them I mean you know it's commission uh, they actually perform an audit over their numbers to determine if those bodies, because $5 million, think about that, the millions we paid it, how many bodies is that representative? FTEs, I mean, it's hard to imagine that they had that many bodies sitting on this. Everybody just put their time cards, so is it auditing their time cards? Or what is it that just... Yeah, so they're, they're, they're closing out the contracts. The, the CTC's uh, executive director, she used to work in audits. Though. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. And I appreciate what you're doing. This has nothing to do with you. But I, 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 to, to go along with him, it's, a, it's in our craft. This is crazy. When I saw that, I said, really? In fact, uh, Caldecott Tunnel, I used to think, was great. But every time I see it on one of these reports, I, I, I don't want to drive through it because I'm afraid I'll get a bill. <laughs> Well, just that during, I do remember, and, and during my orientation, um, Randy was very clear about these items. Um, is there a way to front load it in the budget presentation so that um, staff is presenting it to the commission um, rather than having it come up as a, a <laughs> yeah, as a question, um, a more, I don't know. Maybe, As a question from the commissioners, that, yeah. yeah. So, so tell us what it is up front, so that um, it's very clear and explained. So, thank you very much. Uh, we'll make a note of that, and we'll continue to have a, have a little more conversation about these things, um, not just at the budget budget meeting and the mid year budget meeting. Um, so again, the capital projects for Measure J, um, we have a large budget of about 240 million. Again, I always want to point out the capital project uh, division is the largest part of this. Um, it's about 123 million dollars, which includes the CIP projects and a lot of the sub-regional projects on that as well. Um, and I touched on a little bit before um, in the sub-regional major streets category, which is about $12 million. We have $4 million set aside for the Kirker Pass, um, $1.3 million for Crow Canyon, $2 million for Alhambra Creek, and we have $1 million earmarked for a Danville City, uh, City uh, Street project as well. And then you go down to the BART improvements, we have some continued um, $4.6 million funding for the El Cerrito Del Norte project. Um, so that helps make up part of that huge um, $70 million use of 
reserves that we have earmarked for this particular process. Um, again, I just want to point out, you can see the changes, the SR4 bypass, which is the CIP5 project, and there in the middle you can see it was closer to 17.5 million last year. We're closing it out. It's about 3.6 million this year. Um, we're going to get about $3.7 million of ECRA funds. Um, we use Measure J funds up front. We're getting reimbursed. Um, as I move into the next slide, um, oh, I already had it on the prior slide. I, my apologies. Um, so with this, we'll move right into the administration. Um, administration is up about up to about $5 million. We hardly ever see it up this high. Um, in last fiscal year, we paid off part of our PERS, and that helped bring the administrative level up. Um, we see an increase of about $1.6 million. Again, that's the use of some Measure C funds. We've earmarked about $2.7 million from Measure C to help help us move in the TEP if we choose to move forward with that organization or that, that process. Um, our salaries and benefits are up um, only because we're, we're going to be filling some positions. Um, we had a couple vacancies at our mid-year budget. Um, we'll be filling and we'll be fully staffed in July. Um, and then there's always our increase in property lease. Our lease um, increases just based off of like a CPI every year. So we have about a $10,000 increase for for our property lease. Um, this year I created an information systems replacement. Um, I am going to increase it. We're going to try and get a lot of our computers upgraded. Um, we're going to look at maybe some cloud solutions. Um, a lot of this is depending on um, after some thorough analysis that we continue to do. And if we do move forward in a larger project, we'll come back as an individual item and then update the budget as needed. Um, our authority-wide pension, post-employment, health insurance, um, again, they're slightly going up only due to filling some vacant positions. Our programs division um, is up $2.8 million. All of those funds are earmarked based off of percentages that we collect. Um, and the increase is of $2.8 million is because we started funding the ferry service. Um, the ferry service has been in existence for about six, six months. Um, we're currently negotiating the actual revenues to our, to our fees, and we'll be working on the budget piece of that as well. Um, we also have the TLC and PED bike. We have some additional projects and programs that we'll be doing this year that will be part of the increase right there for $2.8 million. All of those individual contracts and working with the, author with the individual cities comes directly to the board for approval. Uh, local sub-regional street maintenance is about $18.4 million. Again, that's 20% of our sales tax funds. And then we have some the TFC program, which is $1.7 million, which is about the same as it is annually. Uh, the GoMenum system program is about $1.2 million as well. Um, the planning division as the CMA division as well, um, they slightly down $83,000. They have a number of studies that they do. They have a lot of priority areas that they're wrapping up, they're working with the individual cities. Also the growth management, action planning, and monitoring a bunch of deliverables. Um, so that stays pretty much the same. The debt service is going to go up about $3 million. That's only due to some escalation in our our our. our our, our bonds, our active bonds that we have out there, we had quite a savings um, on a long-term basis by last year in 2018, um, refinancing, de-risking $100 million of the $200 million swap, and we will be drawing down uh, the final $21 million projected in the, in the bond proceeds. With that, that concludes my presentation, and our recommendation is to pass this on to the full authority board, and should you have any additional questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Questions? Uh, Brian, thank you. Um, you know, with Susan's comment, I agree about uh, just at the full board, just to add the, up front the explanation on the call to cut. Um, and um, I really want to say I just I appreciate the way that y you exude confidence because you are confident and you are very competent. Um, you have um, just sort of organized things in a way that is very forward thinking. You're always looking out and really, really appreciate that. Um, where are we at um, forward thinking um, with the remaining 100 million or so we have on our swap? How's that valuation doing um, now? And what's our sort of negative and positive on that? Just so. 
if you recall, we had a 40, kind of like a $40 million mark. Um, anytime the valuation of the swap fell below $40 million, we would post collateral. Um, I think at one point we posted close to, it, it had a negative value of $65, $67 million. So we had to post like $27 million. Um, the way this one is structured now with a refinance, it, there's still a $40 million mark. And the valuation we get on a monthly basis, I think the one for at the end of May was close to about $17.8 million. So the likelihood of us yeah. getting there, um, should they move interest rates all the way back down to zero, um, you know, there hasn't been any news of more than maybe one movement this year, how that will work with that. Um, but I think we're in a perfect position. Um, I just did speak with our, um, with our, with our bond team, um, because we're, we're, we're still a couple, a couple years away from maybe doing it, being able to do something. Um, and when, when we have the opportunity to call those again, we'll go through the exact same process we did in 2018. And if it looks favorable, if there's a way that we can break even, I will be back in front of the board to say, let's just move away from this, get more into the traditional fixed rate bonds, um, and see where we are. Um, right. and maybe the, the, the future in the next year or so will give us an idea. Bottom line is we're just in great shape. It was a good move that we did it. Um, it dropped our collateral requirements dramatically. Uh, well done. Thank you very much. I'd, I'd recommend that we uh, move this forward as well. Have a first. And with thanks, I um, have looked at a number of budgets over the year and had heard that everybody wants to be a commissioner on CCTA because it's so well managed and um, the reflection of, of the staff's work in the budget and the presentation is much appreciated. So second. Okay. Any more discussion? Call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Nine. Status update. E-Builder software information. I'll take a second. I'll take a second. <laughs> I'll just skip the. Well, I'll jump into the dashboards and we'll do that part. Yeah. You do have a recommendation of three hundred seventy-five thousand dollar contract, and uh, so. So, in October of 20, 2018, the authority board approved the contract with eBuilder for three hundred seventy-five thousand um, dollars for implementation of the eBuilder program management information system, and this is actually the current implementation process that we've been going through to implement the system. Um, we kicked off the process in November. Uh, we went through a series of discovery meetings and basically identified, you know, what are CCTA's uh, standard practices, uh, system requirements, and also looked and identified opportunities to streamline those processes. And then we took those processes and um, put them into eBuilder into a series of workflows, reports, and then now we are um, in the process of doing integration with our financial software system, Tyler, as well as doing data migration to make sure that the system is set up correctly and doing basically a, a system requirement validation. So we're taking uh, completed projects like I-80 San Pablo Dam Road and putting them into the system and, and migrating all the data from Tyler into the system and comparing that to our financial plans and our reports to make sure this, the data is being showed correctly. We are almost at a point to where we're gonna go, go live with the system. Um, our targeted date right now is July 1st. And the first set of projects would be the Innovate 680 uh, program and suite of projects. That'd be the Northbound Express Lanes project, the part-time transit lane, advanced technologies. We're also planning on using this for the um, recently awarded uh, Mobility as a Service grant with FHWA. It's a very complex financial plan and also we are in the process of developing training materials and guides so that way we can have the proper in-house um, expertise so that way we can do um, basically self-supporting training. So train the trainer, if you will. 
And then uh, we are going to be using it on Innovate 680 and some of our uh, active projects. And then we're going to be monitoring adoption as we go through that process. And then we eventually would be rolling it out to some of our other projects. Um, the implementation team consisted of, of folks across the team to, in various um, uh, areas of the, of the authority to make sure that it meets everyone's needs. And I've already went through this. This is an example of one of the eBuilder workflows. So the benefit of a workflow is it's very consistent and standardizes everything that we're doing on a constant basis. This is our contract approval workflow. So yes, this is every single step that we go through to approve a contract at the authority. And so it constantly brings in all of the standardization, brings in more data. When we actually change something in the contract, it has to go through the same process. We have the reasons for the train, why the scope changed, the schedule changed, the cost changed, and all the justification that goes behind that. And we will continue to track that data to better understand, you know, what we can do in the future to be better manage contracts and also uh, manage our budgets to make sure that they're um, spot on when we're developing them in, in, in the future. This is also... The dashboard and reporting that we'll be able to have at our fingertips, so we'll be able to have all our funding categories in Measure J, as well as a potential future measures um, at our fingertips to understand where we stand as, in terms of the overall funding um, for the program. We also will have uh, funding by subregion, so we'll be able to track in real time our expenditures and costs and budgets by by subregion in, in the system. And then we'll also have programming, or I'm sorry, project management dashboards and systems. So we'll be able to understand, you know, how much total project funding is allocated to a project, what's your total commitments and contracts, how much funding you have left over. You'll be able to determine your project clash flow, your cost summaries, and understand exactly the exact status of all your commitments and contracts. Um, You'll also be able to, because we'll have this real-time data and budget information, we'll be able to understand in real-time exactly how much Measure J fund we're actually leveraging on a regular basis. Um, and we'll also be able to track the uh, reimbursements. Um, so we'll be able to know when invoices have been paid and then how, and then be able to uh, track that and know when we can start um, being paid by other folks and get reimbursed for our time. So that we, it hopefully minimizes the, the demand on our cash flow. So... I apologize for the cutoff here. Um, this is the training support that we're in the process of developing, and I kind of mentioned what we were doing. And then local agency adoption support. So this is one of the kind of key items that the authority board discussed in October. And so what we're kind of in proposing is that we're going to be doing a pilot phase, seeking volunteers from two or three cities in the county to really work with them, sit down with them, better understand what their system requirements are, how can we streamline the system, the software, the dashboards to really make it user-friendly and easier for them um, because they have different needs and requirements than CCTA staff. So we work out those kinks, develop those workflows, and then um, and then we do training and do a local agency rollout. And I think the real key here is adoption and support. So as we're rolling this, these, this information out, um, we really want to make sure that we're measuring the success of the overall implementation. So we're, we, there's an actual, in eBuild, there's an actual adoption dashboard so we can understand how many people are logging in, how many people are using the processes, how many people are submitting forms, and really understand the, 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 the dynamic of the system. And then we're also going to be setting up with eBuilder a performance-based analysis. So we're going to be setting up a series of, of data points um, by using surveys and baseline data to understand you know, so how long does it take staff today to create a financial plan? And we, we baseline that data. It might take one week, two weeks. And then in the future, you know, how long would it take to create a financial plan? Well, hopefully it'll just be a click of the button and a report in eBuilder. And then that way we can demonstrate how much time eBuilder is saving um, authority staff time, as well as we can start, you know, measuring and managing um, uh, the overall the risks um, that we have and minimize those risks using the, a system like this. And then our, our goal is to report that to the authority board annually. Um, this is a subscription as a service, so we will be renewing this contract with eBuilder every single year. And the authority board can, do a, can elect whether we can continue using the system or not use the system. And so the existing contract is actually um, um, is going to expire in October. And so we will be coming back to the authority board in October for a renewal of the, co of the uh, a contract. And at that time, we'll hopefully have um, or will have some baseline data and actually some measure success and performance of the overall adoption. With that being said. So I'm that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Um, welcome to the 21st century. Um, I have two concerns. And just to make sure that from Brian's group, you know, that it, that it is um, translatable so that when they do their reporting and tracking that we're not 
you know, if, if they all of a sudden have to take the data, then manually enter it. Um, we at the town of Danville had a problem where we had this great software system for managing everything. But when it came time to do our budget and everything, we had to take and do it manually. And what happens when you do it manually? The odds are you're going to make a mistake, just human nature. Um, so just, to, you know, it'd be great to hear how that interface as we go forward works. And then also just with cities to hear that feedback because we all have our own software systems for our own reasons. Um, but I think for us in the in-house and a project management side, this is, a, this is an awesome tool to have. So um, look forward to seeing come back uh, for renewal. Correct? Correct. Okay, we're moving on. Thank you, Tim. We're on an airplane schedule here. Yeah. 10.0. Okay, so as you know, the authority um, has a very robust program. Um, it comprises of program management, um, as well as in our innovation program, our transportation um, demand management program, as well as various other activities that we're doing on a regular basis. And so by doing that, um, we're only a staff of 20. We can't do it all in-house. And so uh, we elect to have a pro program project manager consultant to really support and be an extension of staff to the authority to complete and do all the great things that we're doing on a daily basis with the authority. And the current contract is actually with Stantec, and that contract expires on June 30th of this year. And we uh, went out for a procurement, RFP 19-2, uh, um, and we had a five-week procurement. Um, advertised it on our new electronic procurement system, Planet Bids. Um, we did track how many prospective bidders there were. There was actually 54 prospective bidders. And we received uh, one proposal from Advanced Mobility Group. And within that proposal, um, staff evaluated it with, uh, as I mentioned, this, pro this contract supports the, all the various components of it. So planning, financial projects, um, all evaluated the proposal, found that the uh, Advanced Mobility Group was um, qualified to perform all the activities and work um, that we do here at the Authority. And just a little background on exactly uh, what that contract comprises of. So overall project management is roughly uh, $3 million of the total cost. Um, our continued efforts to su support our local agencies is roughly $600,000. And then our project controls and contract administration for the authority is $1.2 million. And that includes reviewing uh, invoices, preparing the quarterly project status reports and all the reporting, as well as um, continuing support of our project management information system. And then the funding and programming support um, this is our overall funding and programming, and also included in here is our grant development. So we do have a very successful uh, grant program. Um, we just recently were awarded uh, the grant for Mobility as a Service, Mobility on Demand with FHWA, also a grant with CalSTA, and there's also a number of other small grants that we've run in planning from the uh, Sustainable Communities Grant with Caltrans. And so the key here is that those grants just don't walk in the door. Um, it takes a lot of effort, time, staff time, consultant time to prepare basically really, really well um, uh, uh, proposals basically to, uh, get, to obtain these funds. And then once you attain the funds, we have to actually do more work in order to work up into receiving the actual agreement. So for example, the Mobility to Service um, Grant, we have a line item in here on the, under on-call specialty services um, to work up until basically the end of the year, until we, which is our anticipated target for notice to proceed. Um, of the obligation agreement with FHWA. So basically the, the story here is it takes money to get money into the door. Um, and we also submitted the automated driving systems grant that, that we just submitted with FHWA for, or I'm sorry, with uh, DOT for uh, $10 million. And then uh, two years ago, we actually submitted an ATC MTD grant for Innovate 680. We were unsuccessful, but still it took a lot of time to prepare. So, so we have a... Um, a budget for grant development as well as supporting the MOD, the mobility service, and um, if we're awarded the automated driving systems grant, we also have a budget for that as well. So, how, mu so, yeah, so how much, um, you didn't say how much was in that proposal. So yeah, so the funding and programming support, it's just over a million. Um, and then the on-call specialty services, um, which that actually is our support, some of the various things that we have to do on an as-needed basis. So for example, Iron Horse Trail, 
We're potentially looking at alternative delivery, so we're going to need some expertise and support on that. Also, for SR239, we're looking at potentially looking at alternative financing, so we need support on that. So how much is grant development? So grant development is $672,000 of that $1 million. And the on-call? And then the on-call specialty services total, which also includes the reauthorization support for the TEP, is $2.1 million. And these are annual costs, or these? That's total costs over three years. Out of the eighteen years. million. Yeah, out of the, the total. And then the, the last item is um, support. That's well, eight. there's, so there's two. The so th here comes the next two big ones. So our innovation program is very successful, and so we're continuing to test autonomous vehicles and and, and figure out our first and last mile solution. And that is two point six million dollars over the three years. And then in and then on then the transportation demand management program, the TDM program. For Central and East County is $6.4 million, and the Safe Children program is about a million dollars. So you take all of those estimates, and it, 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 it makes up the $18 million. So there, it, there's a lot of pieces to this. So, so the overall question is, um, and, and some concerns, I know you've heard from uh, Commissioner Pierce about this. Um, it, it's the single largest contract we've issued that I'm aware of for a consultant. It's going, we only had one proposal, and it's because of the complexity of the things that are in here that you've found when you've talked to some of the firms. There's a lot of things being asked here that, quote, engineering firms don't normally do. Um, it's also going to a firm, to be honest, we know them well. They're only in business, I think, 30 months. I mean, this is a brand new company. This is a huge. This represents absolute overwhelming majority of all of their business. Um, so there's a risk in, in doing that, and that because we had no competition at all, those 50-something people you said, they just looked at it, but they didn't participate, and there were probably two companies that said, hey, look, we're engineers. We don't do some of these things. So it, it leads to, I guess, three points. One, should this be packaged and break up the more traditional services that we get on a competitive basis has been packaged out and those those unusual ones be put in an unusual package and see and maybe we only get one proposal right and obviously Hamib's group knows how to do that one big portion because they were doing it with a Stantec portion and Stantec doesn't want to do that work and I get it we kind of talked them into it um, and you know, sole sourcing this big of a contract just doesn't feel right. It just doesn't feel right without having something. So what could we do to, you know, look at this in a way that might might give us um, and to the public and to ourselves some sense that there's some competitiveness. This is a company we kind of know. We nurtured them into business in some way. So I'm just, you know, being transparent about it. What what thoughts have you considered? Um, I'll leave it to at that. Right. So many years ago, looking at this, you're right. Every every time it's re up, like we, you say the same thing to me. You say it's the largest contract that we have, and it is the largest A and E contract that we've had. When I got here nine years ago, we had N Nolte. I think we had Nolte for twenty some years. Just extended their contract year after year after year, and you asked to spread the work around, and that's what we've tried to do, based on your direction, actually your direction, Commissioner Arnrich. And so we we we've contracted it out. We've advertised RFP, so it's not a sole source. It's a, it's a competitive grant or opportunity. The last cycle, we got a consultant. We had a three year, two one year extensions one each, but we didn't extend the contract because we didn't like the performance. Then we went out and Stantec came in. On a mul There was multiple uh, bids on that. We liked uh, their proposal and we hired them. And what happened during that process is there was a disagreement and we ended up keeping the Stantec as our overarching consultant, but all the staff left and came. So it's really the same team that you had with Stantec. So it's like Stantec, but it's not Stantec because it's under a new name. And so when we contract out, you're right, there's some specialty items in that proposal that other firms may or may not have, because there's a number of reasons why you don't, you don't submit, you know, because it takes money to submit. And so it's the, the TFCA or the TDM program is, is very specialized. And so there's only going to be a certain amount of firms that bid that work. 
This is a three-year contract, two-year, one-year extension. The thing that we always like about the, the way these contracts are structured, if the performance isn't good, that's it. We go out with another. We go off for another RFP. So it's not really a sole source. We've had um, a construction contract on Central, highly specialized all electrical work. Le electricians were all down south or whatever. We got one bidder. We awarded because the analysis we did is we got a fair fair um, price. So they've done an analysis of the price of this, the, wa the wage rates, and they're actually a little bit lower than what Stantec offered. So I I'm not saying that's going to appease you. On I, I can't get more bidders in here. I mean, I just don't know how to do that other than split the contract up, which is going to take some time, and then we're going to have to extend this contract. We can always do that and see what we get. Um, but but as I far as I appreciate that explanation, that maybe that's what we could do. I know, Tim, you have recently talked to some of those that didn't maybe put that into our staff report in some way just to be as transparent as sure. possible and to mention that it was we believe it's more competitive based on the analysis on the cost all of The best part of notability on that is that, from what I'm gathering, it's a three-year, right? And then, if we don't care for them, I, who did we get rid of? Parsons? I'm not going to say. But you, you, so we, okay, we got rid of someone. Uh, we, we, there we go. Just thought I'd, because I remember that distinctly. But the idea is that if in 36 months, am I correct? We can also make them go away, correct? Yes. That to me. Thirty days. Oh, Thirty well, days. Well, any time during yeah. the contract, we give them thirty days' notice. And it's not a guaranteed three-year contract. It's a three-year contract. Oh, so in thirty days, we could yeah. pull the plug. Yeah. Okay. As long as that to me is emphasized, I'm yeah. okay with that. Yeah. So with that, I, I'd recommend that we move it forward with all of that caveat of information. I have a first. I have a second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, there's correspondence, clippings, clinician staff reports, anything? I actually have a success story if I can do it really quickly. We closed, uh, what was it, uh, hold on, westbound State Route 4 to take down a sign structure and getting ready for our, our 684 widening of State Route 4, and that went as planned. We closed at midnight last night, opened at 4 a.m., got rid of a 20,000-pound sign structure. We'll do a cron 4 interview I think at 1030 and talk about that tonight midnight four o'clock on Friday the other one will be removed wow so promises made promises kept at least so far nice job thanks <laughs> Let, let's let's make sure we get the other part down before we yeah. total success okay adjourn next meeting thank you buddy. Great fly, share. fly safely <laughs>